hope springs, hope floats, hope lives on. Hope makes us believe that there's always tomorrow to start over again. That's a sentence that I've, I've kind of lived with most of my life and I've kind of lived my life by it. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and friends. I am Suchitra Pillay. And I have kind of lived my life, you know, on hope, okay? And always believing that there is always tomorrow to start over again. It is my pleasure to be here on this TEDx Rambag platform to tell you how, you know, hope has helped me get to where I am today. And I do hope in this next 15 minutes or so, I can instill some sort of hope in someone somewhere. Now, we all, you know, we all have our journeys in life and our journey starts when we're in our mother's womb and hope starts from there. Yeah, the parents thinking, oh, I hope it's a boy, I hope it's a girl, I hope it's a healthy child, you know, the list is absolutely endless. Yeah, but um, what is this emotion that lives with us lifelong? For me, it's always been that feeling that if not this, then something else, you know, is around the corner. And that feeling of hope has helped me manifest so many things in my life. Some still to come, by the way, like I do hope I can have you know, with Brad Pitt one day. But that's another story. Now, for, for a Malayali child raised in Bombay by cosmopolitan parents, um, you know, it's been a life that has taught me so many things, which I live with even today, and I uphold those values. You know, when money was less, and I had to put cardboard soles in my shoes, because the rubber soles would run out, and we didn't have money enough to buy shoes every two or three months, you know, that time I hoped that things would get better. In my preteen gawky years, when I looked like a rat, I'm sure my parents hoped that their daughter would grow up to be a swan. So thank you, mom and dad, you know, for that manifestation. Uh, through, my, through my school years, you know, I was a, I was a decent, decent student and that kind of helped me, um, you know, get marks enough uh, to get into electronics in junior college. And there I hoped that I would get marks enough uh, to get into engineering, which I did. And there started another journey. Four years uh, in that engineering college at the, at the age of 17, that's also when I was, um, you know, discovered by a model agency. And that's where I started modeling. It was pocket money uh, for me. And, and that was great. Now... Life seemed pretty good, but uh, in the first year, I think I took things for granted and I failed in six out of eight subjects in the first semester, believe it or not. Yeah, which meant that I had to give 12 subjects in, um, you know, the second semester if I didn't want to lose a year and I had to pass in all of them. And I did. So there, you know, there was a lot of, there was, there was a lot of prayer, there was a lot of uh, hope, you know, that I would, I would pass and eventually I did. Now, four years of life in that college and, uh, you know, lots of stuff happened. You know, my, my first love uh, cheating on me and ha my heart breaking into a million pieces and me not knowing, you know, what's going to happen after that. But using that, you know, uh, uh, using that to give me courage that, no, no matter what, something better is going to come out of this. And, uh, you know, love is going to happen for me again if I don't, uh, if I don't allow this experience to discourage me. You know, conversations with my friends were always uh, interspersed with uh, things like, I hope and I pray that I'll find my true love. And uh, sure enough, uh, in my final year of engineering, I did get whisked off my feet by my uh, first husband. I say first husband because there's a second one now. But, um, you know, and that time it was, you know, of course, love and everything nice. And, you know, I was extremely, you know, taken up by all of it. And then I got married and um, moved to England after my final year of engineering. And I moved to London, a young bride at 21, ready to take on the world and hoping that this is what destiny had in store for me. But then again, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Do you agree? Yes, absolutely. So uh, in, in England, uh, though of course I didn't use my engineering uh, degree, it was on my mantelpiece and I just kept it there, but no regrets about that. 
I started working in a restaurant called the Bombay Brasserie, which is a very, very famous restaurant over there. And, um, you know, working in that restaurant taught me humility. In that restaurant, meeting Oscar award-winning stars like Anthony Hopkins, Emma Thompson, Jeff Goldblum, you name it, uh, Grammy Award singers like Bruce Springsteen, Gloria Estefan, all of them. It taught me the importance of humility in, in, in one's life. You know, it taught me um, that each of us has our own place in the world. Yeah, and we all have our strengths and weaknesses and nobody gets to sit on that pedestal and say the, that you are right and you are wrong and you cannot, you know, you cannot give your opinions about other people's decisions and how they've taken their life. That's a quality I try and practice in my life even today. Live and let live, they say. And so I lived. There I started, um, you know, I, I did... Um, music videos for Apache Indian and Bali Sagu, um, you know, so that got me um, seen on TV. I used my singing talent when I sang with international artists and, um, um, oh, by the way, Dil Cheese, I even performed on Top of the Pops, but I have to tell you all a secret, I mimed the song because I haven't sung it. You know, I was only in the video with Bali Sagu, so um, I was in that, but then you do things like that in life. Saying which, the incident that changed my life, and I have to tell you guys about this, was my first audition. My first audition for a French film. Uh, they were looking for a lead actress. I had absolutely no um, backing. You know, I had never done uh, any professional acting before. Uh, of course, I did play a mouse in uh, Cinderella in the fourth standard, and because I looked like one, it was very easy to do that, uh, you know, in the fourth standard. But nevertheless, here I was at this audition, you know, ready to take on the world, saying it's something else that I want to experience, etc. I went in there, there were actresses from, you know, who studied from all, all acting schools, etc. And uh, there was me. We were given 10 minutes uh, to, to do two scenes, uh, which were very emotional scenes of this film called La Prix d'une Femme, which means the price of a woman, about the dowry system in India. The second scene, I was supposed to break down and cry, etc. And uh, I, I heard the girl in front of me go in and she, she was telling the casting director, Jennifer Jaffrey, oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer, you know, we, we couldn't get into the skin of the character in 10 minutes, etc., etc. She did her reading and she left. It was my turn. I entered and Jennifer Jaffrey, she said, oh, hello, and how long have you been acting? Um, I said, I'm Suchitra Pillay and I, uh, this is my first audition. So she was like, oh, okay, fine. Go ahead, sit down and do your reading. I said, no, ma'am, I'd like to act out, act out the scene for you. I said, all right. Uh, I said, just play the other part. Then she said, okay, use your papers. I said, no, I don't want to use the papers. I've memorized the scene. Uh, and I'll just do it as it comes. By the end of those two scenes, I had broken down. I was actually crying. And I was sitting there in front of her, you know, at her feet, sobbing as the scene demanded. I will never forget, you know, the look on her face when she picked me up. She put me up on the sofa. And she said, now, tell me the truth. So, Chitra, how long have you been acting? And I said, this is my first audition. Yeah. And that changed my life. Yeah, that, that totally changed my life, you know. So at the ripe age of 23, um, you know, I was hoping again here that the director would think the same as her. And I tested again the following week. And then I was in Sri Lanka shooting my first movie at 23 years old, you know, um, uh, this movie. Now, after I came back from that, you know, I just said, I'm going to work hammer and tongs. This is where my life is going to be. I'm going to do whatever it takes. And I used rejections, which are a plenty in, uh, you know, in um, an actor's life. I used rejections as springboards rather than, you know, dead weights that discourage us. So, you know, always use that. Always use rejections as your springboards. You know, life is never a bed of roses, I've always said, but it is how you save yourself from the thorns that counts. I hope you agree. Now, why I say how you save yourself is because hoping here for that knight in shining, shining armor, you know, that's not going to happen. You know, that all happens in storybooks. And here's one area where I feel hope is futile. Because I think you only need you to make those dreams a reality. Do not give up the power to make yourself and your life a success to anybody else. Do not give up that power, um, you know, uh, to put yourself up, up on a pedestal. Make that pedestal for yourself because that will hold you up there for longer. Don't allow anybody else to do it for you. Well, in our personal lives also, sometimes we feel that things are going to go on forever. We hope things will go on forever. But then again... Um, you know, forever also sometimes takes, take, uh, takes a break. So then at 27 years old, 
um, my well, my ex-husband, he moved to another country. I was still in London. We drifted apart, and that meant me coming back to India to my parents' house. Um, you know, at 27, I was uh, the first ever divorced in my mother's side of the family in history, uh, believe it or not. But I came back to Bombay hoping, you know, that um, I, I would uh, definitely do something else with my life. Uh, my parents were standing there with open arms and, you know, I promised them that I would make something of my life without compromising on my values, uh, the values that they had instilled in, in me, without, um, you know, stepping on anybody else's feet and, you know, without, without doing things that other people didn't want me to do. So another hopeful journey began with me bulldozing my way into Channel V. You guys know the channel, right? So... Yeah, so Channel V, I went there and I actually um, met the general manager of, the, uh, of the, um, uh, the channel at a party and I said, oh, by the way, it's a great channel, but it's your loss because I'm not on it. Those were my exact words. I said that and that, you know, got me an audition uh, that week and uh, it got me a job two weeks later in Channel V. It was absolutely the job to have. Yeah, so you got to get out there and do it yourself, you know. After that, path-breaking television serials like Hippie Puree, Margarita, etc., etc. And then, of course, path-breaking movies happened, uh, you know, where I had uh, myself slapping Saif Ali Khan in, uh, in Dil Chata Hai or being bitchy to Priyanka Chopra in uh, fashion, um, you know, teaching Rani Mukherjee how to uh, be an escort in Laga Chunri Medag or being a very docile housewife in, in Karkash. You know, so um, those have all been very, very interesting experiences. And I've been very blessed that in my 27 years um, in the industry, I've worked with some rather um, amazing directors. Now, did I ever hope to be an A-lister? Who doesn't want to be an A-lister? You know, of course, everybody does. And that may have happened for me uh, when in engineering college, I was offered Jo Jita Vahi Sikandar opposite Amir Khan. Yeah, I may have been singing Pehla Nasha with him, but then again, I didn't do it because I would have had to, uh, you know, uh, give up six months of my engineering and I didn't do it. Now, uh, everyone, you know, asks the question, what if in some point of their life? And this is probably the point where I, I, I sometimes ask what if. But then again, I think maybe the life that I'm leading now is the richer choice? My bank balance doesn't say so, but maybe it is, uh, you know. Um, so... I live with no regrets of what could have been, yeah, I, and instead I rejoice in the now, a now where, you know, I don't take life for granted and one where I don't put all my eggs in one basket. So with the result that, you know, uh, though movies and fame came, etc., I've, uh, I've never thought that, uh, you know, I should settle for less, yeah. Now, in, uh, on screen, they always tell us that less is more. In real life, in real life, but in real life, more is always better, and there's nothing wrong uh, with ex you know hoping for more. Um, that's why I've always had a plan B, C, and D, and I've got my dubbings, my comparing, my theater, my singing, you know, a million other things that I do. Uh, all of that is there because uh, acting is such an insecure business, and though you hope for it to go on and on forever, you need to have something else in your life which you can fall back on. So saying that. I'm definitely hoping that my uh, second music album also gets released. You might hear that uh, soon. You know, hope is an amazing thing. Um, I had hoped uh, since I was a child when I watched Hollywood movies how it would be to, to be in one of them. And, uh, um, you know, um, I hoped for that, I think, and I manifested that. And then I got to be in two films, two Hollywood films. Uh, 20th Century Fox, The Other Side of the Door. And another film called The Valley by Saila Kariath, which got me, um, you know, two awards, international awards. Um, that film was very, very close to me because it taught, it actually deals with the loss of hope, what sometimes we call suicide. Um, I lose my 16-year-old child in that film to suicide, uh, to su depression and then suicide. And it is how we deal with the loss of hope, the consequences of hope. It's really funny, isn't it, how a film which deals with the loss of hope and its consequences actually got me what I was hoping for all my life, an international award, right? Actually, two. <laughs> but I've never been one uh, to rest on my laurels, though. You know, onwards and upwards, no matter what, is the best way. And uh, for, that was uh, love, which I wanted in my life again. And that's what I did. I kind of hoped for love again to happen in my life. And that did at the ripe old age of uh, 34, where, you know, I met my uh, present husband, Lars, and I married him. And then, um, 
at 37, you know, when I was hoping, hoping, Are, I will, I want to have a kid, etc. That happened too. Uh, and at 37, so girls, don't you worry, okay? You can have a baby at 37. <laughs> uh, I had my child and that was a beautiful, beautiful journey. Now to me, have a partner who holds your dreams in their hands as carefully as you do is absolutely a blessing. And with Lars, I always knew that, um, you know, when I was working, when I had the opportunities, he took over the responsibilities, which gave me the com confidence that Anika, my daughter, would always grow up with one parent with her. So after 17 years uh, together now, we still hope uh, for a lot of things, um, you know, together, and we work towards them through the struggles, through the strife and everything. Life is never easy, you know, they, uh, they say, but it is our choice to either sit down there with our head, with our, you know, head in our hands saying, uh, uh, why me? Or, you know, you can get up and do something about it. It's always better, you know, when you see the glass half full, don't look at it, uh, you know, don't look at it as, it's, as if it's half full and not half empty. Yeah, and instead of saying, oh my God, I have so little, what can I do about it? say, wow, I have so much in the glass, let me fill it up a little bit more. The one time that I felt utter hopelessness, I have to say, is when I was told that my, my father had only six months to live. And uh, um, that was out of my hands, and one didn't really know uh, what to do about it. But the way he dealt with it, hoping that miracles would happen, hoping that the, the medicines would work in his final, in his final days, is, um, is, is what taught me a little bit more about hope. Um, well, um, after that, sorry, I get, a bit, I get a bit emotional when I talk about my dad. Nevertheless, after that, it's been, you know, it's been a, it's a, it's been a wonderful journey. It's, uh, it's brought me where I am today. I do whatever it is that I have to do to keep, um, to keep uh, myself busy. And um, hoping for things, hoping for change, hoping for success. They're all valid hopes and, uh, you know, you need to, but what is it that we do to, uh, to make those hopes happen? You know, um, we have to work towards it. God has to see us doing something towards it to make those things happen for us. You know, Einstein um, once said, um, what did Einstein once say? <laughs> Einstein once said, you know, uh, learn from yesterday, live for today, and hope for tomorrow. But don't ever stop questioning. Um, also, Martin Luther King once said, you know, um, only when there is full darkness, you can see the light or something to that effect. So I would say embrace the darkness and only then you will appreciate the light. Always hope for things that will happen in your life, but believe in, in it and, they, and make them happen yourself. Don't give that power to anybody else. Don't allow anybody else to do it for you. Make, in, make it happen for yourself. And here's me hoping that all of you live lives where you get everything that your heart hopes for. Thank you very much for listening.